Ajax it is. Thanks again for stopping by. If you're new to the channel, my name is Riley and I'm a former Jehovah's Witness. And today I'm interviewing Debbie Edwards, who is also a former witness. And uh, she has a really interesting story to tell, full of ups and downs. And um, I'm sure you're really going to enjoy this. So hi, Debbie. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for um, agreeing to participate. Um, You're welcome. Okay. How are things going with you? Very good, actually. I'm enjoying some nice warm weather. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. We're having a great bank holiday weekend so far. Yes, yeah. So far, so good. Yeah, good, good. All right. So, would you like to uh, just tell everyone a little bit about how we first got in touch? Well, I saw you. I actually have been following you for for a while. Um, I think I found you came across your channel during the um, pandemic while you know I was increasingly trolling YouTube and looking at videos and uh, you get sort of like drawn into stories and then um, Lloyd Evans formerly uh, John Cedars did a, a, a broadcast I think it was last week or maybe the week before where he interviewed um, up-and-coming YouTubers, ex ex witnesses, and you're one of the people that he spoke about or that he spoke to. And um, I just then went back to your channel and made sure you like caught up on all the videos. And then I just thought, well, I'd like to share my story um, with Riley. So I emailed you and just told you a little bit about myself and what my story was, and we took it from there. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I'm, if I've missed something, I probably have. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm really honoured that you, you know, chose to share your story on my channel. I'm, I'm very honoured and humbled by that. Thank you. Oh, no, you're welcome. So, how did you become a Jehovah's Witness? Um, well, my my mum was contacted by the witnesses. Actually, uh, my parents were are divorced now, but at the time they were not yet, they were still together. I think I must have been around, I don't know, maybe 12, 11, maybe 11, 12, yeah, around 11. And they came to the door and uh, actually my, my dad answered the door and he was not impressed at all. <laughs> he sent them, he sent, he sent them packing. Um, my, my parents were both born and bred in the Catholic church and you know very kind of connected to it through their families as well um subsequently my parents uh marriage started to fall apart and um there's six of us so i've got i've got five siblings and my mum was then sort of left sort of struggling with with five with six kids and i think the witnesses still had her on her on their radar they came back and on the second visit of course dad wasn't there to block the way and the mum started talking to them and, uh, you know, tried to, you know, entertain a conversation. I remember it was an elderly Greek couple um, and they came along with it. Was it the truth book? It might be the truth book. I think it was the truth book that they... The little blue one. Use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so mum started studying and, of course, you know, they offered, they offered to... Kind of help her with the kids and you know how witnesses come along and offer all kinds of support and yeah kind of went from there with my sister and i think my sister and i started studying together with the pioneer and then we after a while we were encouraged to study with the younger ones in the family right right so at that point did uh all of your 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 entire family come into the organization well, my, my inter, by entire family, if you mean myself and my siblings, yes. Um, I was the second eldest, so my sister was the eldest, I'm the second eldest, and then the others are all younger. So really what mum said went at the time. <laughs> and we all started going along to the meetings and in the ministry and uh, uh, studying. Yeah, But my, my mum's extended family were not... Uh, Ever witnesses and never became witnesses um, and they lived quite far away we'd moved a little bit further out of London so I think also mum was feeling a bit isolated living far away from the family right Our immediate family sure sure so it was your your mum uh, yourself and your four siblings correct right, right okay 
And uh, did you ever progress? Sorry, five, five siblings. Sorry, five siblings. <laughs> wow, <laughs> big family. So yeah. um, did you ever progress to baptism? Yes, uh, after a while um, studying, I, I remember I got baptised around 15 at that time. That was considered young. Imagine now it's like they get married at like seven, uh, married, baptised at seven or eight. But anyway, it was at that time it was considered young. Um, I got baptised at six, uh, 15, my sister was 16, I think we got baptised at the same time at the um, Bowes Road Convention, if anyone remembers that. Yeah, I remember Bowes Road. <laughs> Thank you, do you? Yeah. yeah. I, I never went there, well, I, I never went there as a child, but I visited there as an adult. Oh, okay. Uh, that was our circuit assembly site. Yeah, when, when I was a child, uh, well, when my mum first came uh, into the organisation, um, the assembly was Dorking. So that Dorking oh, is where right. everyone went. It was before yeah. the Surrey Assembly Hall was built. And right. uh, yeah, Dorking I heard is, of Dorking. Yeah, Dorking is where my mum was baptised. Okay. I think my mum was also baptised at, um, at um, Bowes Road. That was kind of where everybody got baptised, majority. Right. right, okay. So you were baptised at the age of 15. Um, up yes. until that point, um, you you know, you're obviously studying and going to the meetings with your uh, mum and your siblings. But what was it like for you being a witness at, at school? Um, you know, we were not the kind of like Bible bashing type of witnesses. We, we went to school. Our witness, our witness life and our school life was quite separate. But at the same time, we kept quite a low profile at school we were quite popular <laughs> because we were in a school um where you know i don't know really any other way to put this but we were the only black kids <laughs> <laughs> just tell it like it is yeah. we were the only black, black kids and we were very kind of good at sports and i was good at um music and um we were kind of the, the cool kids but um we just kind of like kept a low profile i remember Mum kind of let us do stuff. I mean, we were not strict. I mean, she wasn't really a strict witness. We, when, when it came to Duke of Edinburgh, I remember um, D of V, I was allowed to go on that, so I went camping. My sister was allowed to go on a trip to Wales. Um, my brother was you know, leading the sports team. And But, you know, we didn't, when it came to like parties and stuff, we were not allowed to go. So it was, and my mum always made sure we kind of went to school together and came home together. You know, we couldn't leave anyone behind kind of thing. And we did after school clubs and we learned to play instruments. Um, I learned the piano, I learned the clarinet and the violin. And uh, yeah, it was, it wasn't too bad actually. I didn't, it wasn't traumatic or anything um, without incident really. Oh, good, so it sounds like you had quite a liberal um, witness upbringing. I think we, we did. I think my, I mean, huh, mum might not huh, um, thank me for saying this because she's still in, but she pretty much just did it the way that it suited her and kind of still does. She, she, you know, she always kept in touch with her family and uh, made sure that we always travelled to see my grandparents. Coincidentally, it was always around Christmas because it was the holidays. <laughs> and then we'd spend the whole of summer holidays um, up there. And sometimes the, the family, the kids would come down to stay with us during the sam summer holidays. So although we were uh, going to the meetings, going on ministry, we were never really estranged from family or um, separate. Never didn't really feel separate from family. Um, there were aspects where we felt different in terms, like when I got to, when I got to like the last sort of year of school around I was 16 I think you know going on dates and stuff and you know the boys like you get secret valentine's cards and things like that and we just were not allowed to entertain any of that <laughs> just um so that's when we we had to kind of sh show up and say well no not allowed to not allowed to do this not allowed to do that not allowed to go here with you guys not allowed to go there and my friends never really gave me a hard time they were just like okay yeah, didn't really care too much about why or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Did any of that change after you got baptised? Well, um, I got baptised at a time when we were um, moving house. 
and so I remember I was doing a commute, quite a long commute, to 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 back back and forth to school, and I I did I don't think I really understood the the rules as such. I mean I remember um, not being not thinking oh I'm baptized now now I have to be super holy and and be and be like spiritual. I just was carried I just carried on as I did before. Um, it was almost just like passing about passing a, a barrier and moving on to the next thing. I, my lifestyle didn't really change, I can't say. Now, I remember uh, there was a, a boy from school that always used to walk me to, this, um, uh, to the station. <laughs> and so, and that never changed. <laughs> so, <laughs> before or after, so I didn't, I didn't, you know, never really became weird or anything like that. All right, all right. So from your um, teenage years, so, so your mid-teens um, up into adulthood, um, what, what was it like um, during that period? Well, once we moved um, into central London, it was completely different. I'd also uh, I'd also finished from school, and I was you know it was it was a question of what do I do now? Do I go and get a job? Do I go to uni? And I really wanted to go to university. And I remember um, I did very well in my in my CSEs and O levels as, as it was then. And my teachers were really trying to encourage me to do A levels and. Um, wanted me to go to uni and I remember telling my saying to my mum I really want to go to uni and um, I was also good at art and I was considering studying fashion design and um, I remember mysteriously the next the very next meeting because the meeting the congregation that we went to was a much more pragmatic kind of young and hip congregation where all the young people were pioneers there were special pioneers assigned Whereas the congregation we came from, it was very much like a divide between the young and then, and then quite old, quite elderly sisters, brothers and sisters. Um, so the next meeting after I said to my mum, I'm thinking about going to uni. Um, I had two special, special pioneers kind of corner me in the Kingdom Hall and they were telling me about, you know, they heard that I was considering going to university, but do I understand that the this, this uh, system is coming to an end and... You know, they, they have such an amazing life, um, special pioneering, and that would be something, have I considered it? Um, so I remember feeling really kind of confused because I, I, I kind of had my life planned out as I wanted it to be. Um, but then I was also a bit of a people pleaser. Um, and so when they suggested that, also partly I was like quite happy to have the attention of two special pioneer sisters that were like the popular ones in the con in the congregation and um, really kind of interesting people that just joined our congregation from elsewhere and were um, trying to get all the young people involved. And so I I remember saying to my teacher, I'm not going to go to uni. And then my teacher was like, why? And I said, well, I have other priorities. I didn't, I didn't really want to, I wasn't the point where I was going to start preaching to them. I just said, well, I've got other priorities. And that was how my uni plans were derailed. And then I just became a, a pioneer, uh, initially auxiliary pioneer. And then a regular pioneer and I was kind of taken under the wing of um, the pioneers and special pioneers in the congregation and that's when I think that's when I think things started to change I think I remember getting much more involved in the pioneer life and I did I did pioneer school which I really actually enjoyed um, and you know I just lost touch with all my school friends and just didn't maintain contact with them with anybody really outside of the the Kingdom Hall. Also, at that time, we had quite a nice group of young people in the congregation. So, you know, they kind of, we all kept ourselves entertained and didn't really feel the need to look outside or feel like you're missing anything. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel about the decision to sacrifice university for pioneering? I mean, were you enthusiastic about it? Did you do it reluctantly? No, not really. I mean, I was I was fully indoctrinated, and I, again, I was like, um, I you know, I wanted to go to uni, um, but but I also wasn't there wasn't a fire burning that I had to go. I was like looking for guidance, and I think at that time, if my mother had said, "Oh, I fully support you going to uni," you know, you should go, I would have gone. But whoever whoever had had the most influence in my life at that time 
would have swayed me because I really wasn't sure. I was looking for guidance and looking for encouragement or, uh, you know, and that's, that's you know, the, the overriding uh, impression I got was that why, why bother this world? You know, this system's coming to an end. Join us in the interesting life, you know. So later on in life, I was definitely disappointed. I was definitely, you know, it, sometimes it's a delayed thing. Um, and I, I did actually just do my degree, um, distance learning. I got my qualifications that I wanted to get back then anyway. But I didn't have the university experience, which, you know, incidentally, I've made sure that my children have. <laughs> so my kids are in uni now. And I love the fact that they're having that experience, you know, yeah. to yeah. normal lives. Sure. So you threw yourself headfirst into uh, a spiritual activity. Uh, yes. pioneering and you know you really made made the truth your own as the saying goes oh yeah I remember that expression <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah is there such a there's such a hierarchy isn't there with to pioneering it's almost like if you're not pioneering then you're like you know not good association and the the the, the, the people that were held up as good association in the congregation um, they're like the in the in crowd were all pioneers and um, you just felt like you wanted to, in the same way you'd want to be, be part of the in crowd in anywhere at that age where you're impressionable. I wanted to be part of the in crowd and they were pioneers. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's especially um, a status thing for sisters, for, for women in the congregation, because they can't actually reach out for, um, like, to be elders or mystical servants as, as men can. Mm. So pioneering is like the <laughs> the most you can actually do. So it, it, it's very attractive for a lot of um, uh, sisters to to actually go into that. Yeah, I remember I wanted to go to Bethel as well. Once after I did my pioneer school, which I really enjoyed, and we and, and it actually part part of it a lot a large part of it have took place in Bethel. I um, I really wanted to go to Bethel, like, and then the next thing was oh. So that means you've got to marry a Bethel, a, a Bethelite, because you don't just as a woman, you don't just sw swan into Bethel uh, like that. So there's all, you know, there's all these things that sway you where where you're not really thinking about what you want. You're you're being kind of moved by what the organisation says you should do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what happened next? Um, you, you're pioneering now. You're, you, you know, giving it all of your time and effort um did how long did that last for uh from memory you know it's been a long time <laughs> if memory served i think i pioneered initially for four years on a stretch that was from from pioneer school onwards um and then i i remember around 19 i uh met my husband who who was a ministerial servant and who was visiting from um belgium he was he was visiting because our, our congregation was um i think remember i mentioned to you our congregation was quite central congregation so whenever there was um tourists in in london they would and i think in the bethel or their congregation would direct them to the closest central congregation and, and that was ours uh, our Kingdom Hall was 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 in a central location, so we had we had a lot of visitors. When when you say tourists, you mean um, tourists who were Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. Do you know when you go on holiday and you, you and you and you want to find out where's a local congregation? If you're going to a city, then it's probably going to be a congregation that's in the city, and and our congregation was in the city. And I remember um, a couple of like celebrities came through. We had um, we had a visit from Michael Jackson once wow um <laughs> the, they, they, he, they sat him in the front row in the corner with an elder on each side wow and, <laughs> <laughs> and i was i was a pioneer at the time and they were like um well, we're gonna have a special uh we're gonna have a visiting brother on sunday i just need to let let the congregation know that you know he, he is well known but we don't idolize anyone so don't treat him any differently than you would any other visiting brother but they were also kind of insinuating, don't like, rush up like fans type of thing. Um, and I remember when he when he came in, he just came on the Sunday and he went actually in the ministry afterwards. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how he disguised himself, but he actually went in the ministry afterwards. Wow. Um, they said, uh, I just went up and said hello because I just thought, well, I would normally go up and say hello to a visiting brother or visiting sister. So I went up and said hello. 
Hello, hello, brother Jackson. And he shook my hand with his with his gloved. <laughs> <laughs> was it just the one glove? <laughs> was it white yeah, and sparkly? It was, it was white. And white. <laughs> it wasn't sparkly. <laughs> it was white. I, I kid you not. not. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and then George Benson came through um, once. Uh, he was in town as well. So yeah, it was. Um, one of those congregations where there's also always something you, you just never knew what Sunday would uh, turn up. Quite, it's quite exciting. And um, then this brother came to visit from um, Belgium. Uh, two brothers actually, and we met. I think I was 19, and uh, just had a conversation, and then we just started writing um, long distance writing letters. I remember that back in the day before social media. And people wrote letters we'd write a letter each day every day i'd write a letter like a diary and he would write one so i was constantly getting letters and he was constantly getting letters and then i was still pioneering but i would also be going go to go back and forth like to go and visit in belgium and he'd come to london i'd always go with my mum or with my sister um as a chaperone and all that um so i was kind of that was what was happening uh, then I was working part time. I think I was working for Marks, Marks and Sparks at the time, advert. Um, <laughs> and that was yeah, and that was that was it. Um, two years of that, and then got married, and, and that was at twenty one, and we got married in that in that congregation in that Kingdom Hall. Okay, so you were married he over here. Married over here, right. yes. But then, did you go to live in Belgium with him, or did he move to the UK? No, I remember um, saying to him, where would we live? And he said, well, I've, he, I have a good job. Uh, I was, you know, pioneering. I can pioneer anyway, isn't it? So he said, um, we'll, we'll, I'd like you to move back to Belgium with me. And I was quite excited by that prospect. Um, but then, you know, he did say that we'll, we'll re we can reconsider the situation after two years. If you're feeling that you're missing home too much, then we can reconsider coming back. But let's give it a try so we moved i moved with him um to a tiny congregation outside of antwerp wow Belgium. Mm. very different to where i was leaving from yeah i can imagine i mean what was what was the witness culture like there com compared to um in london um very kind of small town very small town everybody knew everybody's business uh the elders' wives had their clique. The ministerial servants' wives had their clique. The young people were very had their own separate clique. I remember the young the young people were. It's funny because uh, not, not funny, haha, but funny, strange that coming from a congregation that was very central, where there was lots of distractions and temptations, the young people were quite involved in in the uh, in the organisation. Now I went to this congregation, which was in this little sleepy town, and the young people were just running riot <laughs> every week somebody was being marked or or um reproved or disfellowshipped it was generally the elders kids running amok <laughs> just you know i remember just feeling being quite shocked at how much discord there was amongst the young the youngsters i think they're probably bored um but people were very friendly um it didn't really occur to me that there was that, that i was being treated any differently inside the congregation uh, and there wasn't anything obvious until we had an instance where my mum came to visit and the funny th the thing is I was I told you I absorb languages very quickly so I remember in the first three months I could understand the language I'd, I wasn't confident enough to speak it so I wasn't I didn't really say that I understood it I wasn't advertising the fact that I understood it but I could understand what people were saying and I was reading it also from the watchtower etc and in the, in the six months I started to speak but when I uh, in in that interim where I started to understand it my mum came to visit and I and then she left you know she had a visit and she left and then I, I was at dinner with my a husband and some friends um, at their home and I overheard them talking about my mum but they didn't know I could understand and I don't know whether they realized but what they were saying was unacceptable. You just never know. I mean, I'm not going to label anybody anything, but sometimes you just think, are you thinking, you know, before you speak? 
um, they were discussing that my mum's visit and they were saying that, oh, my husband was saying, oh, she spent some time at the seaside because his parents had a, a home on the beach. And then th um, someone said, um, what did she go to the seaside for? Is she, is she looking for a suntan? Isn't she black enough? And they said it in, <laughs> in Flemish. And I was like, you know, I tried to not to express, show my face that I'd understood it. Yeah. And then they all laughed. And I said, as I would normally say, oh, what's the joke? What's the joke? You know, you're laughing. I don't know what the joke is. Could you translate? And my husband was like, oh, no, they just said something funny about... He just basically lied and said, oh, they just said something funny about the football or the basketball or something. So he knew that it was unacceptable. And and then my mum started to have have these experiences where she felt um, she wasn't comfortable. And so she, you know, after a while, she just wasn't interested in coming over anymore. She just wasn't comfortable. Um, but I, I, I always felt quite, you know, as he was an elder at that time, I was always very, you know, happy and comfortable um, in the early part of being there. You know, I was, I was having new experiences and seeing another, another way of, of life out there. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think I started regular pioneering again. I, I, yeah. I started pioneering again after a while. Mm. That's really terrible that they, you know, speaking that way about about your mum. Mm. It's terrible that your husband laughed. I mean, yeah, you know, that, um, I, I can't yeah. help thinking does doesn't he realise that by insulting your mum is also insulting you since you're black as well? Yeah, I mean, that I don't know whether we ever connected um, in a way that he was. You know, when you have a really good strong relationship and you just. On, you just uh, have each other's backs. It doesn't. It's not even a conversation. I never really felt that from him ever. We were married for seven years. I never really felt that we were like a team, us against the world. So uh, at the time, it didn't really surprise me. I think what he was trying to do was trying to avoid drama because he knew that if he said it and explained it, then people would not. You know, I'd have to have a reaction, and then there would have to be, and he probably wouldn't have wouldn't have wanted to have that awkwardness in the room and he still he never came clean about it even when we got home or anything I just never forgot it because it was when I it was my first kind of experience of hearing something that they clearly did not expect me to or didn't want me to they wouldn't have said it in English in other words and they often they often spoke English around me um, because they wanted to you know as, as they do in Europe you speak it you speak their language and they're like no 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 I want to speak English because I want to learn the language I want to practice my English so that a lot. Yeah, my experience with people in Europe is that most of them speak better English than English people. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> you feel very embarrassed because you, you, you're there trying to like fumble through their, their language. You're like, where did you learn it? TV, mostly. We, d we don't get Belgian programs or Flemish programs here, but they do. They get a lot from America on TV. Yeah. So did you experience any other incidents of racism amongst uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in Belgium? Um, yeah, not not so much directly amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. What I what I experienced was a lot of racism in Belgium in itself and a lack of empathy or understanding from the witnesses. Like, you know, I felt like I was having this experience by myself and that nobody could identify or validate it because it was so it was an alien concept to them that it could happen that, that it could be happening so there wasn't there was that not that there was no level of awareness that must have been an extremely isolating experience because you're in a new country you know um you're the, the it's a completely different culture a completely different environment and then to be subjected to to that kind of treatment yes it was it was very um isolating and it was very I remember starting to get quite depressed mm, I can imagine uh, because I felt like I mean going back a bit you know he had you remember he had said that if after two years you're not feeling comfortable we can consider coming back and after two years of being there I did say to him I'm not I want to go back to the UK and of course you know that that parameter had changed that you know he found excuses for that not to happen um, like, oh, I've got a job here and it will be difficult for me to find work in London. I mean, he was an electrician. Electricians can always find work, <laughs> but, you know, and I could have also found work. Um, and so 
I wasn't really happy even with, even without all of the rest because I was missing my family and my friends and uh, so when that was on top of things on top of everything else when that started to happen I remember feeling feeling really isolated and 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 for the first time feeling like I just didn't belong um, and simultaneously it's strange because I felt like I didn't belong in the country and I also felt like I didn't belong in the in the congregation because it was just a very isolating experience um, the el most of the elders were quite quite a lot older than my husband so I didn't really fit in with the elders wives click um, I didn't really fit in with any of the cliques either so it was it was just not a very good time for me yeah I can imagine I can imagine so here you are now you're no longer a witness um, I can I, I gather I gather that you're, <laughs> you you haven't been a witness for quite some time so how did that all yeah. start to unravel well so um, around seven years into our marriage um, things had become quite we were just like strangers we were not we would he would be this he'd, he'd be the like the um the star of the show in the meetings and then we'd get in the car to drive home and not a word and we just were not talking to each other and it was just no relationship there was just no warmth or uh connection it just died um i remember my daughter was my only kind of like means of feeling like I was alive and enjoying life. Um, and my uh, my mum wanted to go and visit my, her sister in America. And I wanted to go with her and have a, have a holiday because I hadn't had a holiday in a long time. And my sister, who was older than me, my eldest sister, had at that point left the organisation. She had got, she I think she was disfellowshipped and she was divorced and she was living in America. So mum's going to America to visit. I want to go with mum, sister's living in America. Um, at the same time, the, our marriage is completely like falling apart. Um, so of course my, my husband knew what was going on with my sister, I told, I told him. And I remember, you know, getting ready to go on this trip, but the marriage was really the, the fact that the marriage was really struggling and I felt so depressed and isolated also bothered me and I wanted to, I requested a shepherding call as you did. I don't know whether they still do that now. Uh, I, I don't know. It, they, they, they did the last, when I was when I was in, which was two years ago. Uh, oh, but, um, okay. Yeah. Maybe they do them but over Zoom now. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so like, like the good elder's wife. I, I requested a shepherding call um, to, you know, to have some counselling, you know, because I... I just felt like, well, someone, you know, someone must see what's going on and uh, maybe we'll get the help that we need and then we'll take, I'll have this little holiday with my daughter, uh, he wasn't coming with, and then we'll come back and it will be, it'll be fine. Because um, I really wanted the marriage to work. And um, I remember when the elders arrived <laughs> for the so-called shepherding call, they, I felt it was a complete ambush. So they came in as like three elders, so there's four men and I'm sitting there and I'm expecting them to get the Bible out and start talking about marriage and quoting scriptures and maybe looking at the marriage book or there's a book that was about relationships anyway. And what had actually happened was he had gone behind my back and said to them, my wife's going to America and she's going to go and visit her disfellowship sister. And because they're very close and I think you need to counsel her. So I'm thinking they're coming to talk about the marriage and so they come in and they're like, oh, well, we understand that your sister's left left Jehovah. My sister, by the way, was living in Chicago and I was going to New Jersey and I was not planning to go in anywhere near Chicago. So um, I was like, sorry, I thought we were talking about building building up our marriage. And they were like, well, no, it's come to our attention that you you may be planning to speak to your sister and so we feel that we need to address this and then they started to tell because each of the elders had had a, a, a child that had been disfellowshipped so they started telling me stories about how they have to walk past their children on the street and ignore them and um how they if that's what jehovah requires and 
that's what I should be prepared to do with my sister. Uh, if she's turned her back on Jehovah, then you have to turn your back on her, basically asking me to shun my sister. And bearing in mind, I've been, I've been away from my family for that long, missing my family, depressed, isolated. And also the betrayal of my husband just like assuming that that's what I was going to do and not even... Something just kind of shut, you know, something just shut down. I remember sitting there in that room, looking at these elders and nodding like that. Mm. And then saying in my mind, this is a load of rubbish. This is actually mind control. And this cannot be from Jehovah because Jehovah's a God of love. The reasoning that I have was that Jehovah's a God of love. Why would he condone breaking breaking up families and... He knows that my sister's my only support network. How can he expect me to just cut her off and have nothing to do with her? I knew she wasn't going to come back, so that was that would have been that. And we're we're very close. We're seven, uh, eleven months apart. Although she's, you know, so we're we're almost like twins. We like to say. Um, so I remember thinking to myself, I'm I'm checked out. That's when I yeah. checked out. So is it chemo? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> physically and mentally out. <laughs> They didn't, those terminologies didn't exist back yeah. in the day, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I remember I went on that holiday. I mean, saw them out. Uh, just, you know, didn't really want to make a fuss with him because I wanted to go on the holiday, you know, just without incident. Um, went to sleep, got up the next day, left for the airport. He saw us off. And I remember at that on that holiday just feeling like, wow, I'm now actually really just experiencing life as a normal person because my mentally I wasn't I wasn't thinking I'm going to go there and go to the meetings. Uh, my mum's a witness and I remember going, getting to America and she was already there and she was trying to get me to go to the book study and I was like, I don't want to go to the book study. We, we've got plans on that day. We're going up to Atlanta City or we're going to, you know, we have plans. And she kept on kind of trying to coerce me to try and go to the meetings. But my aunt who we were visiting was not a witness, so I could kind of do it like that. And and that was it. And I think we spent two weeks out there. And by the time I got back to Belgium, I was completely like over it. Um, you know, just literally just arrived back. And uh, I remember, and this is going to sound really heartless, <laughs> but I promise you it wasn't meant to be heartless. Um, but I remember kind of as we drew, drew into the... Um, as we drove into the place where he was picking us up, just my heart just sank. And I saw him and my heart just sank. And I just thought, to, I just thought to myself, I cannot go, I cannot carry on with this life. I don't believe it anymore. Um, I'm depressed. I knew I was depressed. I'm, I'm un, and I'm happy and we don't have a relationship. And I remember we got off this um, shuttle bus and he picked up my, his daughter and, and then he said to me, Do you, did you miss me? And I said, no just I just said no before I wasn't saying it to hurt him it was just a statement of fact I didn't miss him I had an, an amazing time on the holiday I had plenty of time to be to kind of understand that I could manage my independence because you know I got married so young um, the fear of being alone with the child kind of I overcame that and I was just I just made up my mind so when he said that I said no I, I didn't miss you and he just was just kind of glared at me and we drove back home in silence and i think those are the last words we exchanged because the next morning he got up and went to work and i got up and picked up my suitcases um the same suitcases from the holiday i hadn't unpacked or anything uh and my daughter and just left back to the uk and i didn't go back to the meetings i went back to my mom's and she, of course, implored me to try and go back to the meetings. But I said, I'm, no, I'm done with it. Never went back. And so that was it. Wow. And strangely enough, they didn't come looking for me either, really. No? The witnesses. No, I think, I think when, you, when you fade out from another country and you come back, it's almost as if... Yeah. They, yeah. they just present that you're still you, in. Kind you of slip thing. through cra the cracks. I did. I, and I didn't ever disassociate formally or write a letter and I wasn't disfellowshipped, I just left and never went back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So and that was it. The, the majority of, of people that I speak to who have um, woken up and realised that this isn't a true religion, they, they, they wake up because they realise that the doctrines aren't, or either don't make sense or are unprovable. Mm-hmm. But in your case, it sounds like that what caused you to wake up was the treatment that you received. Would that be correct? Yes. I mean, it was the treatment that I received. It was the uh, the, the feeling that everything was for show also. I didn't really feel like I was living an authentic life. Even in my, even in my marriage, we didn't have a relationship, but he was the shining star of the congregation but then we didn't have so he had he had no we had nothing that bound us and there was no communication and warmth but he was like the star of the congregation and then um what my sister leaving and them saying to me well you do know you have to shun her i was never going to do that that was never going to happen so i would rather be out um and have a relationship with her um, it's not that I, I, I believed also. Well, once I realised that that this this religion was not from Jehovah, because it was about men's rules and and you know um, proving a point, shun them so that they'll guilt feel guilt and come back. And the whole thing about living forever and everlasting life and that also fell fell apart like a pack of cards. I didn't for a minute um, believe that now I was leaving, I was going to be destroyed or anything like that. Although, Although you know, there's, there's that thing, thing when, when you, you, when you, you leave. leave. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know that. The, I know that the thing. slightest story in the news. Is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Tribulation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I soon got over that, though. <laughs> wow. Wow. We all go through that. We I all know, go right? through That's that. PTSD, it's crazy, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. Right? It actually yeah. is. I mean, it affects That's all of us in varying degrees. All of us who have left, you know, the witnesses or other cults or high control groups is something that we 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 all contend with unfortunately i mean it was tough i I won't i won't pretend it wasn't like uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't easy at all it was very very difficult and i was there were some dark years um afterwards to do with you know other things but um it i never once considered going back um I felt free. I felt, I felt like I was actually living, and I was connected to life, you know. And and I was making friends, and they were good people. You know, they were not all. Uh, it wasn't Babylon the Great. They were not all, you know, heathens who were trying to take me down dark paths. You know, I was twenty eight when I left, and I felt like my life just started. And then when people say, "How old do you feel?" I always say, "I feel that I, I feel twenty eight yeah, because." <laughs> That's, that's when, when my, my life started. started. Yeah. That's when I did just doing everything, everything, you know, yeah. that normal people, people do. do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There are a lot of similarities between our stories, in fact, because shortly after I left the organisation, I was disfellowshipped in April 2019. Okay. And um, I just got into a new relationship and I felt much similar to what you've just described, that I felt like I was living for the first time and, and actually being myself for the first time I was meeting new people I was making friends I was traveling you know and um, I got to experience real love hospitality from people that I was told were had no other objective than to do me harm that's right you know and it's, it's so nice it's so refreshing also to just have that feeling that your time is your own if you want to get up on a Sunday morning and go for a walk in the park, you can do that. Your time is your own. Your time is not pre predetermined for this meeting or that meeting or that ministry or that circuit assembly or that district assembly. And I remember, um, I remember, I took a job at the time. It was my dream job um, with British Airways, and I got to travel all over the world, and and I was able to just like really. You know, just have this, it was like a renewed life choice, like a, a chance of having having a life. And I was young enough to, I mean, you're never too old, obviously, but I mean, I feel like um, I was able to just do things that I hadn't yet missed out on, you know, and the things I had missed out on, like uni, I did that later. 
because that's what I wanted to do for myself and I did it you know so and that was my choice that that really resonates with me doing things that you missed out on because up to this Ooh. very day I have a Saturday morning ritual and that is to watch cartoons for at least two hours <laughs> in bed <laughs> Really? What's your favourite cartoon? <laughs> At the moment, it's X Men. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so every have Disney Channel. Channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every yeah. Saturday morning, um, when I wake up, it's it's X Men for like two hours oh, cool. <laughs> be- yeah. before I do anything else, <laughs> and I, that's my way of catching up what I missed out on. <laughs> <laughs> when you were forced out in the ministry in freezing co- cold snow and ice, oh wow, yeah, the trauma, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you, we've gotten to the point where you've woken up, yes. uh, you've left the religion, you're back in the UK with your yes. eldest daughter. Yes. Yeah. And you've taken a job with British Airways and you're enjoying life. Yes. Okay. So what happened next? Um, well, before, but it, okay, before I took the job with um, British Airways, I... Um, was advised by my mom to try and get a place and get a place of my own. Uh, and I had to go to the council and, you know, do all that stuff. And I needed mum to look after my daughter for a while, while um, I lived in this horrible temporary accommodation, which they give you in London, which is often like in the middle of King's Cross in the red light district or something. And um, mum, you know, I think she was trying to encourage me to um not to go back to the truth so she felt that uh or go back to my marriage so she she said well i'm not going to look after your daughter let her go and stay with her dad for the summer so she was going to anyway but i asked him to come and get her a bit earlier so that she wouldn't have to come and stay with me in this horrible dingy place and i think he saw that as an opportunity to um get get her back or get me back so he he took her and he didn't he he didn't agree to bring her back when he was supposed to but basically he took he took her kidnapped her um back to belgium and i went to belgium to pick her up and was told i couldn't take her and got a lawyer and was told that uh, due to the hague convention uh which is a law specifically for uh European citizens married to foreigners in their country and who have children. I think in Belgium, there's an instance where uh, Belgians would marry Moroccans or, uh, and then they would, the marriages would break up and the Moroccans would take the children away to Morocco, like a kidnap. So under that uh, law, I was, he he, um, petitioned for her to stay with him and I wasn't, he wouldn't allow me to take her out of the country. So, um, yeah, that was a big deal. It was a, it was a hugely traumatic time in my life where I just felt like I'd lost my child, and um, I sought legal counsel. But I also had to set my life up so that when I did get her back, I could could support her and, and everything. So I just carried on, and at the same time tried to um, manage what was going on. And at at the time, I got this opportunity to work for BA. So while I was working for BA, I was tra- flying back and forth to Belgium to visit and having flying her in um, back and forth uh, to visit me. Um, and then I got into another relationship, which became my second marriage um, shortly after I, well, about a year after I joined BA. And uh, he was uh, a Nigerian who was living in the UK, but had planned to go back to Nigeria. <laughs> so I remember him telling me early on when we were dating and I was like, okay, well, you're going back to Nigeria. Dear, that's be nice, nice knowing you. you. <laughs> I'm not going anyway. I just got back from exile in Belgium. But he was like, oh, no, you know, don't, don't jump to conclusions. You never know. Let's just take it one day at a time, play it by ear. So we started dating and after like three years, I agreed to visit. And when I visited, I absolutely loved it. Because I'd, I'd visited, yeah, I'd visited the West Indies, my, my grandparents' um, home in Dominica. I'd visited that uh, a year before, or a couple of months before I visited Nigeria. And the places were so similar that I, you know, that I felt like I was at home. I felt very much at home. And anyway, long story short, we dated and ended up getting married. And uh, I moved to Nigeria uh, with him. 
Um, my daughter at, at this point was coming back and forwards, back and forth from Belgium and, and then eventually back and forth to Nigeria. And I was also going back and forth to Belgium. And um, we had, we, we, we got married and moved out there, had two children. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I say my Nigeria years were the best and the worst of my life because the marriage fell apart. There was a lot of infidelity. Um, he wasn't a witness, obviously, because nor was I. Um, but he just wasn't, you know, a good husband. So there were a lot of things that happened that um, I don't really want to go into in detail here. But let's just say, that, you know, that the marriage fell apart. I came back with the with the with the children to the UK in 2014, and funny enough, I'd been out of the organisation so long at this point that it was like a distant memory to me and it's also even more distant because you're in another country where nobody ever knew you were a witness um i did actually join i did actually out of curiosity go to the meetings out there though in, in nigeria okay did, did you do that frequently did, I? did you do it frequently no i maybe went about three times <laughs> i remember taking the kids once they were like mom what are you where are we? What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, like, what, what is this? What, what made you want to experience that? Well, I had a friend. Um, I was in. I was very much involved in the, like the uh, outside of my work. I had a lot of hobbies, which were like to do with the creative arts. And I used to go to a play reading group. And I had a friend who was a um, a poet. And we just we, we became friends through our play through, through the play reading group. And it turns out that he was grew up as a witness as well so yeah so when we found out about about each other we talked and we just said oh you know wouldn't it be funny to just go back to the meeting and see what it's like, like? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was just like a bit of mischief, mischief really, really. And, right. and, then, and then we went and it was quite you know it was just something to do on a sunday you know just something different to do on a sunday and it was um but without emotion and without trauma it was so strange so initially we would go and we'd just pretend we were like visiting from another congregation and uh then I remember, um, oh, they always come up and start talking to you at some point, you know. So sisters were coming up and saying, oh, hello, sister, where are you, where are you, where are you visiting from? And I was like, oh, I live in Antwerp, um, in Abuja. And then, you know, you know, th then they found out where I worked. I told them where I worked and a couple of them turned up at my office um, um, to, to try, try and sell, sell me cloth. <laughs> So I, 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 I don't think you were not expecting that. Everything is everything is business. Everything's about a business opportunity. So I think when they found out where I worked, and I worked with I worked with a lot of expats, um, these sisters were she was a tailor. So she she came to my office one day with like samples and said I wanted to show you these and maybe you can show some of your colleagues. I was like, how did you even find, how did you even find my office? You know, I found it so invasive. I found that they were very, they wanted to be so involved in your life. And I was not, they didn't know. I mean, I was not a witness that was involved in the congregation. And I was just someone who came a couple of Sundays and then they were turning up at my house. They were turning up at my work. I, after a while, I just stopped, uh, I just like wouldn't answer their calls. I stopped taking their calls. I stopped going to the meetings and they started looking for me, calling me, um, stopped taking their calls, uh, stopped uh, answering the door if they came to my house and eventually they left me alone. <laughs> that was, uh, I was like, whew, should not have, I should have known they would have tried to pull me back in, you know. But um, yeah, that was a bit, a bit of an experience. So uh, in 2014, once my kids uh, were ready for uh, their upper, upper secondary education, I came back with them. And it occurred to me that I had no friends. <laughs> so so I, I, I looked for this. Uh, I found out about this meetup um, thing that people did now because didn't, it didn't exist before I left. And I looked at the meetup, the different interests, groups of meetup. I thought, oh, this is a good way to make friends. And then there was one there for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. I was like, whoa, that's so like, out, that's so like visible. You know, I always used to be witnesses being very in the back in the shadows uh and so i joined and through the meetup group i met i made friends i made um i met um terry terry o'sullivan and uh stee uh terry and steve are doing they you know were doing tours regular regular tours and meetups and 
you know, little Christmas parties that we have at Vauxhall um, Bridge. And yeah, that's kind of how I got, you know, in touch with the witnesses. But it's so strange because I feel like I've, I've been out such a long time, but it's still, it still never leaves you. It's always a part of you. Um, you, you, you never go back to being, well, was I ever? You never just assimilate. Well, for me, I, I found that to, to assimilate into just general population and, you know, and say, oh, I'm just the next person. Because, I, I mean, I do everything other people do. But part of who I am is the whole experience of being a Jehovah's Witness. And I find it, it's something that I need is to just be around ex-witnesses who, who share that history. It's a shared understanding. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand. I mean, yeah, in fact, yeah. I, I joined that um, meetup group as well, but I joined oh. post COVID. So I haven't actually been to any meetups only online. We okay. have, yeah, we have them occasionally online, but unfortunately I haven't got to meet anybody in person, but I would dearly love to when this pandemic is over. Yeah. Some of my best friends are, are from the, from the ex JDub group and um, they're great. In fact, the co-founder, Stee, I actually yeah. remember him when he was a little boy. We, we were in the same congregation. Really? Wow. I, he wouldn't remember me because he was too young, but I, I, I do remember him. He, but wow. he, he was only small. Have you, have you told him that? that? I have. I actually told him that last week. We were on a Zoom, on a Zoom okay. meetup. Yeah. Of course, he didn't remember me, but um, I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know yeah. you. I know, I know your dad yeah. very well. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. That would freak me out. I mean, I was saying to, I, I went for a walk with one of my friends from the XJW group and I was saying to him when I see when like my mum she whenever I see my mum and talk to her she's always telling me oh about the good news about oh like oh this sister's now a circuit overseer's wife and this one is now pioneering and but I'm sure there are those that have left but she'll never give me the updates about those <laughs> so I always wonder if any of the people that I was in with have left because you don't hear about them how how would you Parents don't update you um, about that stuff because that's like, you know, giving it, giving it air. Isn't it? Yeah, energy. yeah, I understand. I mean, fortunately for me, since I started my, you know, activism and have, you know, I'm quite visible with a YouTube channel and everything. A lot of people I know from years back who had left, I mean, sometimes 20 years ago, have gotten back in touch with me that way. Mm. Uh, just by coming across one of my videos and then realizing that I'm also out and then getting in touch with me. That's happened quite a few times which is yeah. really nice, it, it, you know, that, that's one really big plus side of yeah. of being out there is that, you're, you know, people are able to get back in touch and reconnect with you. It's been really good. Yeah, I mean, that's, if anyone out there knows me <laughs> from back in the day, ho holla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I hope they do. I sincerely hope they do. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. So have a... A real reunion. <laughs> I think I think our first uh, meetup post COVID, like proper post COVID, is going to be a raw. You should definitely, definitely come, come for that. One. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> I would not yeah. miss it for the world. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you this evening, Debbie. Oh. No, it's a pl pleasure's been all mine, uh, Riley. Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> and it's great okay. to see that you're still 28. <laughs> <laughs> Like the shop Forever 21, it's Forever 28. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Thank you. What a great story. I hope that you really enjoyed um, hearing Debbie share her story. I know that I certainly enjoyed discussing it with her. So thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching to the very end of the video. If you haven't already done so, please like, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. If you like my work and want to help me continue doing it, please support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Jexit underscore 2020. And with that, I'd like to sincerely thank these very special patrons who make these videos possible. 